Hello and welcome to the Little Knowledge Podcast. We are back again feeling, well, really filling a sort of a hole in what we've talked about because we talk about historic houses and the tales and the stories linked to them and they've mostly been aristocrats, really. But now we have to fill, you can't talk South Wales without talking Iron Masters. So, so we're doing Kafartha Castle today. Mm. Uh, my name is Paul Busby, and with me as ever is Goff Morgan. Are you ready to fill your Iron Master hole, Goff? I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going anywhere near that remark, Busby. That <laughs> no. yes. Greetings to everybody. Nice to see you again. As How we are head you? Into the mines, uh, yeah, the, 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 the miasma that is the, the history of, of iron making and iron masters in our part of the world. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Have a nice I had a day off. Um, I'm blazing about, that's about it, really. Threatening the hoover at the living room, but not really achieving much with it. Just threaten it. Let's show the air on, clean your devil of, I'll put this over you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to say, we've been talking just before we um, started recording about the fact that really there is lots of Kafartha Castle stuff on YouTube already. Mm. Uh, some of it is very good. I would suggest anything by Christopher Parry, who I heartily recommend, is certainly worth a watch. He works at Kafartha Castle Museum, as it is now. Do find him on YouTube. He's extremely good. Um, but we usually don't do a topic where there's lots of stuff, but we really have to, because you can't talk about South Wales history and large houses without the Iron Masters. I mean, the Iron Masters were yes. huge, weren't they? Well, yeah, yeah, they, they, they are a, a dominating feature in this part of the world of the Industrial Revolution, and, and then the, the rise of a group of people who became incredibly powerful and incredibly rich and influential outside of the existing aristocratic structures that the society was still dependent upon at that point. You know, these weren't county people. Uh, oh, no. These were people that, you know, clawed their way to the top, a lot of them. yeah, well, It's all just... self, it's pretty much self-made what we're talking about yeah. today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and who became phenomenally rich people as well. Um they are divisive figures, though. And we can't we can't ignore this. Even today, um, there are very clear camps uh, oh, yeah. around around the iron masses and around the figures. Um, so uh, be prepared to be extremely annoyed at some point from either side of it by any things we say. But it's because you can't talk about these people without you know, hitting all sorts of triggers for people. So yeah, so here we go. It's very <laughs> rare for either you yeah. or I go off to annoy someone. I'm, I'm oh, why? <laughs> oh, I don't There's know. I've had my no moments. problem. <laughs> now, first of all, we start with almost channeling Frankie Howard, the prologue. The Before we get to Kafartha Castle, our story today begins with uh, this chap here. This is Richard Crochet. And Richard Crochet was, um, well, in a theme that will run throughout this entire podcast, he didn't get on well with his dad. Oh, oh, interestingly, one of those, one of those families, are they? Uh, oh, absolutely, almost yeah. Hanoverian in yeah. the distaste between father and son at certain points. But Richard Crochet, it was said he was the son of a farmer um, from Yorkshire, and after a bitter quarrel, according to Crochet family history, he decided, well, that's it, I'm leaving. And he, walked, he went to London with his pony. It took him, I think, 20 days <laughs> to, get, to get to London Gosh. at the age of 16. Well, yeah. And when he got to London, he sold his pony for £15. And that gave him a little bit of capital so he could sort of try and get in somewhere. And yeah. this is a man, I don't care where you put Richard Crochet. You could put him in the year 2400 on Mars. He will end yeah. up a millionaire. Uh, oh, really? Oh, gosh. He's just... driven like nobody yeah. you will believe. Yeah. And he got a job. It sounds a Yorkshire name, so maybe that helped. He got a job in an iron warehouse in London with a Mr. Bicklewith. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, that's George Yard, Upper Thames yeah. Street, London, and he was an iron merchant. And he worked really, really hard, Richard. And it wasn't long before he basically, by 1763, he was the proprietor of Bickleworth's. Yeah. Uh, so he took over pretty yeah. much straight away. Um, but, the, but I mean, he's extremely, I mean, he buys, um, he buys into Kafartha Ironworks in 1794. Because, of course, 
South Wales is the place to be if you're in the iron trade even that early. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, long, yeah, long, long association of it. It was the pre- predominating industry in in Wales at that point. What what we think of as Wales as coal mining actually comes much later on in the nineteenth century. Most of the <laughs> most of the most of the mines that were sunk at the time were then to fuel um, the iron industry that, that was coming up and sitting on top of the iron iron ore deposits. But it's safe to say statistically, because of course it was all agriculture before this. I mean, Merthyr, yeah. where he moved. Um, it was all shepherds and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But when you look at, uh, uh, if you look later in the 19th century, you could call them people have. Wales was the world's first industrialized nation because there were more people working in industry than agriculture after oh, all this had boomed. That's interesting, isn't it? And so uh, Richard um, has money. I mean, marries pretty well. Yeah. Um, uh, they all seem to marry in the industry. Yeah, just before, we, just before we move away from his portrait, you may look at him and think, "Oh, that's a scruff. Look at the look at the look at the stubble on those jowls." <laughs> now, this is again, this is quite interesting because this at this point when these portraits were painted, a little bit of designer stubble was actually. Oh, in. do you think Richard is way ahead of the time? Well, yeah, there are lots of actually. There were there's a portrait one of the last Morgans at Tredegar House, John Morgan in 1793. Mm. And he looks a right bruiser with a stubbly chin as well. But he's, he was a well at the top of the you know major landowner at the time. So it's not because he was a. I mean, it's not because this is his you know working class paupers and roots showing through. That is actually a fashion statement as much <laughs> as much as Miami Vice in the seventies with your jacket sleeves pushed up and designer stubble. So there we are. Which is not typical, by the way. Richard did commission sixteen portraits of himself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but this Yorkshire boy um, basically didn't care about society as such. Didn't care if lords cared anything yeah. about him. It was money. He was yeah. driven. In fact, he said once there must have been something inside him because he said, I must do more than any other man or my emulation is not gratified. I am possessed by an active something within which will not let me play truant for long. Oh, God. So he's extremely driven. Yeah. And of course, Merthyr's perfect. I mean, Merthyr's with all the mineral wealth in Merthyr, and we forget very much. I mean, today, what would you say? The four, well, the four uh, Welsh towns and cities, which are the largest, are very easy. They're Cardiff, in this order Cardiff, Swansea, Newport, Wrexham. Hmm. After Richard Crawshay did his business, the largest town in Wales was Merthyr. Gosh, by some distance. That. They no, went from not. shepherds to the largest town in Wales and globally yeah. important. Yes. Merthyr was massively important. In fact, in 2000, the Sunday Times, I think it was the Sunday Times, decided to put the 100 wealthiest Britons ever, or the millennium, presumably. And this is woolly history and woolly science. But they didn't just put on um, historical, let's look at his fortune in his will, and what is it now? It it took in in mind buy-in power, what you could buy with that. Yeah. And they decided that Richard Crawshay came in at number 95 and that his wealth in, in terms 20 years ago would be yeah. 4.5 billion. Largely. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty big, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> his, uh, his motto was perseverance, which became the Crawshay family motto. And uh, he does tap into the other podcasts we've done because his daughter, Charlotte, um, is the mother of Big Ben, Sir Benjamin Hall, Lord Flanover. Oh, right. There are all kind of links. We've come across Big Ben before. We have come across Big Ben and his dad, Slim Ben. Slim Ben, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But by 1806, I mean, he has, uh, he buys into Kafartha. It's not long before he's running the place, quite frankly. Hmm. Uh, He has six furnaces two rolling mills and 1,500 employed. This is in 1806. Nelson turned up a couple of years before. And um, that when Crochet was thinking about what he would put as a family crest, initially it was cannonballs. Because Kafartha Ironworks made so much cannonballs for the Royal Navy that it almost became yeah, yeah. what they did, you know? Yeah, good, blimey. I could go into, into um, detail about the puddling process, well, yeah, made no, I, for such a great I've thing. Heard I've, you go, go, I've heard you go on about puddling many times. No, that's piddling, Goth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Puddle 
Putin is essentially <laughs> by reverberating furnace. Yeah. And there were six reverberating furnaces at Kavada by 1806. These huge things. You basically turn pig iron, which is a little bit, you know, gristle, yeah. into wrought iron, malleable bar iron, that sort of thing, which is used for better things. Um, and you took over by, from a man called Anthony Bacon at Kafatha. And I'm glad to report to everybody that Anthony Bacon's family crest was indeed a pig. Yes. Well done, that man. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Anthony Bacon. <laughs> yes, Richard Crush. A pig supported by two loaves of bread either side. <laughs> Pat a butter between its feet. <laughs> but there's something that I thought you might find interesting, Goff, because Richard Crawshay, you don't get to the extent of wealth and ruthlessness that this man must have showed without making enemies. And the first ever vice uh, chancellor of England, the lawyer, Sir, um, uh, Sir Thomas Plumer, called him Moloch the Iron King. Uh, Moloch. And Moloch is biblical. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's, um, oh, God, I, I should know this. He's a denizen of hell that they That's sacrifice right. children of, yeah, to. He's, yeah, he's one of the denizens of hell. Yeah, he's one of the, the big the big beasts in hell up there with Beelzebub and, and places like that. Moloch. Yeah. Oh, it die. <laughs> he must have rattled some cages. He rattled <laughs> a few cages. Uh, I think it, also it's the I think it's a ref, that a lot of these references probably relate to the the fires of the furnaces as well. Oh, quite possibly. Yeah, that, good point. It must have been a pretty bloody hell. Like you giving up, you you know, within years of moving into what was an aggregate agricultural and agrarian society, suddenly the place is these blazing furnaces. It must have looked like hell to a lot of people. Oh, well, of Thomas Carlyle. Thomas Carlyle visits Merthyr and calls it hell on earth. Oh yeah, exactly. Simply yeah, because yeah. what you do is, um, I mean, you've got this massive influx into Merthyr yeah. because of the jobs, and it has to be said, industrial jobs at Kafartha they're paying far better than the old agricultural jobs. Well, so people come from all over the country it. and Ireland, and yeah. they come for jobs, but there's no infrastructure. Mm. So the housing is appalling. Yeah, this massive boom, and of course the working is appalling in the ironworks. Oh yeah, and life, Thomas Carlyle called it hell on earth. Your life expectancy was ridiculously short if you were working in these industries. Oh, I yeah. mean, you you just hoped, I suppose, that in the, the short period you could you could work in these incredibly toxic and, and, and cripplingly hot environments. You'd have big enough to just make you know keep your family alive going with it, you know. You had an independence of living on it, which is what was attracted people to this this type of work, but by God. <laughs> It was a, certainly couldn't yeah. do it. No, um, no wonder it was hell on earth, and no wonder he was Moloch, as you can see it. Kafartha, though, I mean, he built up Kafartha as, I mean, the largest ironworks in the world. Mm. Okay. I mean, it was an immense achievement, not done without cost. Yeah. Human cost. Yeah, quite. Um, Nelson and Lady Hamilton visited in 1802. Um, and Nelson uh, gave guineas to people in a local pub if they would toast his health in Welsh. Oh, right. <laughs> Which is quite nice. Um, yeah, the whole idea of the... what they were saying is he obviously couldn't speak Welsh. <laughs> well, no. Well, only one yeah. crochet could speak Welsh fluently, but we'll come to him. He's oh. my favourite. Yeah. Um, this talk at this point is of the Iron Crown. This is way before Game of Thrones, yeah. the Iron Crown, because he hated the other Iron Masters. Because oh. you had others. It wasn't just Crawshay. You had Dowlas with the Guest family, Lady Charlotte Guest, famously, of course, who um, translated the Mabinogion into English. Mm -hmm. uh, you had uh, Plymouth, which was the Hills, mm -hmm. but later the Crawshays took over. Kafartha was Crawshay. Penadaran was Humphrey. Humphrey, yeah. Who married into the Morgan family at Tredega House. Mm. These are four massive ironworks focused on this town. This is the centre of the industrial world, mm. Merthyr at the time. Um, in fact, his wealth was so extreme that his notion of disinheriting his son, because of course he didn't like his son, he's a crochet, mm. was to leave him a mere £100,000 in his will. <laughs> That's, I, I could do being disinherited with that now. <laughs> he died in 1810. God, it's an incredible amount of money for 1810, isn't it? He's a billionaire by our terms. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At Kafartha, the original iron... This is the prologue. I'm, so... no. I'm sorry about this, people. We haven't got to the Not castle so... yet. Um, this is the original uh, house. Now, 
Every house we've seen of any aristocrat who has had links and leased their land for agricultural use, uh, for uh, agricultural and industrial use, has stayed well away from the work. Yeah. Their house, like Tradiga House, possibly in the beautiful Monmouthshire leafy countryside, is how it works. This is the first Kafafa house. Mm. It's in the middle of the ironworks because an yeah. iron master is not an aristocrat in the bows. No. He's essentially running the ironworks. Yeah. Do you want to be close? And this was uh, Anthony Bacon's house at one stage. So that was the initial Kafafa house. But it's really insane. It, it must have been a very odd life to live there because you have all the trappings of extreme luxury and you're surrounded by the people you're spending the money out of who are not living in extreme luxury, living in probably near poverty a lot of the time. Mm. And, and around you, you have all that heat, smoke, noise, belly. I mean, it, it so how, how do you sit there, you know, having a nice gentrified cup of tea while all that's going on around you? It's bizarre, isn't it? Strange, strange. Well, this is this is the reason why they built Kafartha Castle in its yeah. uh, to begin with, but it's still very close to the ironworks. Oh yeah, it overlooks it. You can stay and come out the front door and watch what's going on. Yeah. Oh, there's one room in the, in Kafartha Castle where which was called the office, and the office had three windows which overlooked the ironworks. Yeah. So when you're concentrating on business, you can have a you would look directly okay. at the ironworks. Um, this is Richard Crochet's son, William. A lot of Williams. This is the first William. Mm -hmm. So he takes over, but he has bad memories of Kafartha, probably because of the clashes with his father. Yeah. This is a very personal kind of tale, this of mm -hmm. you know, internecine family warfare. Uh, he even said at one point, William, that I I shudder when even I think of Kafartha. He couldn't yeah. be in the same room as his father. Yeah, that's interesting. So what he did was he continued to live in London. And so what you had was at the London house, which was still in George Yard, Upper Thames Street, the, the London house where William stayed, that did all the selling. Well, Kafafa mm. did all the uh, creating, you know, created the merchandise. He separated it. So my nerves are all unstrung when I even think of Kafafa. So he stayed in London, which is why he's not that well known in Merthyr to this day. Oh, right. So oh, William right. is not particularly clash with his son as well, yeah. of course, because that's the way. But the yeah. thing is with William, he was always threatening to either resign or die. <laughs> <laughs> his son was desperate to take yeah. over. And William would say things like, um, well, I'll resign this year. Mm. To use a topical reference, it's very like the relationship between Winston Churchill and Sir Anthony Eden in the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> one for the teenagers <laughs> one for the teenagers there he was always saying he was going to resign but then he was always complaining about his health that he was going to die soon and he's not long for this world mm -hmm. um he made a slight mistake with his son william the second when he said that i tell you what son i'll give you four thousand pounds a year or i'll give you three thousand pounds a year and pay for your new house you want to build <laughs> now, he probably yeah. didn't know his son was going to no, build quite, quite as extravagantly yeah, quite. <laughs> as he did. Yeah. Um, there was certainly between, there's the son here, William II. Yeah. Um, interesting about this iron throne, an iron crown sort of thing, because the father used to say, there's a letter which survives where, again, he threatened to resign, and his son is really desperate to get in and take over everything. And there's various arguments. And the father writes to the son, you will be sovereign early enough if you will be content to allow his present majesty some shadow of royalty. <laughs> oh, <good> Lord! <laughs> At one time, he decided he was definitely going to resign and he, they were going to go to the theatre together. Why wouldn't you go to the theatre together? Unfortunately, they went to watch King Lear. Oh, God. And by the end of King Lear, uh, William I decided he wasn't going to resign after all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just in case he wound up on the hills of Merthyr, nude, shouting in the storm. <laughs> <laughs> but he did leave William II to basically run the Kafartha Ironworks. And it was William II that did actually build Kafartha Castle. Again, as we have said, Goff, uh, how noisy is it living at Kafafa House when you're surrounded? At least go a little bit away. Mm. So this is a wonderful little painting here. This is Kafafa Ironworks, even at night. This is at night. Oh, yeah, yeah. By Penry Williams. 
Um, so it's still, I mean, it's noisy. It's not healthy yeah. to be close to this, is it really? No, no, it's not healthy for anybody. I mean, living in that, I mean, working in that must be such astonishingly awful. Oh, absolutely. And so he, it's the so when sun. Was that, when was that painting done? Uh, well, it looks to me, if you look over here, as if the castle is built. So oh, I yes, think it's probably yeah, the 1830s. Yeah. Oh, that, isn't that interesting that the, the, the artist has actually incorporated the castle in well, the distant overviewing it? That, that's yeah. an interesting little touch. In the darkness beyond it, you can see all that lit up. And, and I mean, Henry Williams uh, was the first to paint the new house anyway, but there were problems with the new house because he wanted to build this house and his dad was fed up with the amount of money his son was already spending. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. He, said, oh, he was really anti the building of Kafartha Castle. And this is a very wise man, actually, the father. Yeah. He often gave advice to his son, such as, don't lower the wages of your staff. Oh, Be prudent good. here. The son didn't often listen for good and ill for the father, of the father. Mm. And so he did build this enormous castle. Is this a good idea? to build an enormous, extravagant property which looks directly on your workers who are not always having the best of times. Yeah, and at the same time, you're reducing their wages. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. We're yeah. giving you less and we're building this. Oh, yeah, yeah, really, really, really. So this is Penry Williams's um, first paint in the first image we've got of Kafafa yeah. Castle, which was built by William II. I have to say about William II... Um, he was a radical in politics as a young man. Oh, he was very much for suffrage. Um, oh, uh, it, it, it is quite, and he was. This is the thing. One of the great things. I even picked up a volume of, um, you know, a horrid histories. Yeah, the oh, vile yes. Victorians. Yeah, and it mentions oh, William oh. Crawshay the second, and it mentions the truck system. Yes. Now, the truck system, famously, for those who don't know, is you're not paid in money, you're paid in sort of tokens, which you can only um, use at, say, crochet properties. Hmm. You quite often end up in debt to the crochets, except that's a nonsense, because William II was utterly anti-truck. There oh. was never the truck system at Kafartha. How interesting. That's a genuine yeah. myth. That has seeped out into the local populace. Oh, that's, that's interesting because because the Morgans um, uh, of Tudiga House and, and the Tudiga Ironworks they abandoned the truck system as well. Oh, yeah, they were against anti-truck, but who weren't yeah, were the enemy? Isn't that interesting though? That why because it, it persists. It, it's such an or hideous feature of in the industrial uh, uh, landscape at the time. The truck system that two of the major, you know, iron manufacturers and, and owners seem to have abandoned the truck system in this part of the world. I wonder why that was. Well, they did. I mean, uh, it's it's a very wise thing to do, but the well, uh, that Dallas did have the truck system. Yeah. Uh, it was Lady Charlotte Guest, actually, who, we, who wrote about William II, saying, beyond all rule and description, he is one of those meteoric beings whom it is quite impossible to account for. So William II, like his grandfather, was also something of a uh, something of a force of nature. But he's built this thing, and his dad says, "Don't build it. You're just wasting money on this." And it's very grand, isn't it? Look at the lodge gates. A lodge get a lodge with a porch. That's impressive. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Those are some of the best sort of lodge gate houses I've seen in a long time. They're fantastic, aren't they? Yeah. It's massive. It's not really a castle, though. And it's not really in Kafartha. Oh, the part right. from that Kafartha <laughs> castle is perfect. It, yes, it's doing well there on both counts then. <laughs> well, they, Kafartha means the barking place. The barking place? Yeah, because it was a hunting ground and the dogs. Oh! That's what oh, Kafartha right. means. Oh, right. Oh. A barking place. Yeah. But it's not really a castle, it's a mansion. Yeah. You can't fortify that. Um uh, and it's not in Kafartha. Kafartha actually originally was just over the water. So, <laughs> oh right, gosh. But nevertheless, I mean, you can see how it goes. Yeah. Um, but what he did put in his new mansion is the White Rose of Yorkshire, which you can still see to this day. Oh gosh, yes. Oh yes. It's all down to Richard, isn't it? Yeah. You've got oh. a great view here of the castle overlooking the ironworks. It's yeah. a massive castle, and the ironworks. 
Is that even is it that um, the, the drawing that we saw earlier of it, the uh, the painting of it? It's quite. It's almost a companion piece to the ironworks piece, isn't it? Because mm. in the ironworks, you see the castle through the through the gap in the murk on the hill, and when he's looking at the picture, that it's the the smoky remains of the of the uh, the factory is coming up, or the, the foundries are coming up. Yeah, this one is a uh, it's astonishing, isn't it? I mean, oh. mate, you can even. It's just boggling to to get think like what were they thinking of with that? You know, you've got this this vast statement of affluence and the people who are putting every penny into your pocket to build it are just at the bottom of the hill working yeah. in the most horrible condition what well, it's all it's it's brazen isn't it and and, and provocative and it's an ah, incredible yeah. statement isn't it well provocative is absolutely true um however i mean william the second was a very good family man it has to be said his office in Kafava Castle, was surrounded by the children's playrooms. He said, if I can hear the children play, I know they're all right. Oh, that's But everything you're, you're building here is for your children. Yeah. And this is a self-made man. Well, he isn't a self-made man, but he's taken it on to greater things. Um, And he has got this idea of, you know, uh, but it's such an odd character because he was so radical, mm. suffrage, and yet he really lets himself down in 1831 with the Merthyr riots as they used to be called the mirtha rising as it seems to be oh, called yeah. now and that basically stems from the fact there is a depression after the napoleonic wars they no longer need cannon yeah. uh, balls and things like that and there is a depression and william ii's uh, uh, decision against his father's wishes by the way is to reduce the wages of his staff mm. and that brings it already in awful condition i mean china that part of mirtha called china was essentially a slum at that time mm. with, you know, um, uh, slurry through the streets. It was that oh. bad. Oh, God. There is no <laughs> good no. place to live in China at that time. Yeah. yeah. No infrastructure. This is the problem. Um, yeah. And William II doesn't help matters by provoking it ever so slightly. By... And so what happens is all a lot of the workers, the leaders of the Mirtha Rising of 1831, come from Kavatha Ironworks. Understandably, bad it? decisions yeah. during this rising. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it's, 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 it's totally understandable. <laughs> you can say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. So it's absolutely appalling what's what's going on at this time. But um, when the rising is eventually, I mean, the army come in, the Highlanders. There's this great heckle, which isn't particularly um, enlightened. It's the Highlanders that march into Murtha to sort out the rising. In the end, I mean, about twenty four people get killed. Hmm. This is a terrible thing. But when a heckler is the Highlanders, 53rd, I think, march through Mirtha, somebody says, uh, go home, wear some trousers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Not quite dear. Donald wears your trousers, <laughs> but... <laughs> go home, wear some trousers. Oh, it's very anti-kilt, which I'm, <laughs> I'm quite pro-kilt. Oh, gosh. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> um, but anyway, after all that settles down and life continues... Um, for those that survived, of course, the Merthyr Rising. Oh, he also buys, because uh, he's, he's built this thing, the horror of his father. So he decides, actually, he probably wants a castle away from, with better air, really. So yeah. he buys dear old Hensel Castle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he's there so the kids can go there, you know. Hmm. We've done a podcast on Hensel Castle. Yeah. Please click on it. Please, please click. Actually, Hensel, our Hensel Castle podcast had perhaps the most scurrilous of our tales, if you remember, Gull. It involved a lawnette, a screen, and someone's <laughs> manhood. In context, it's historically important. Go find it. <laughs> yeah, talk about whetting your appetite. <laughs> but remember, I said family's big for William II, and he has a son, William III who takes an interest in iron mastery. He's mm -hmm. going to be the next iron king in this long line. Mm -hmm. Until, unfortunately, William III in 1839, on Sunday the 2nd of September, is trying to get from um, Cafartha to Caversham, which is his father's place in uh, Oxfordshire, now uh, Bedfordshire, and he misses the mail uh, ship, the mail boat, over the River Severn. Right. Um, but he's desperate to get there. He doesn't want to disappoint his father. So William III um, jumps on this tiny boat 
mm-hmm. called the Little Western, and he ch- and he gets across, but he doesn't get across because the conditions are dreadful. If any of you have listened to or watched our um, our podcast on uh, Saint Pierre in Chepstow, you'll know yeah. that two of the Lewises died on the old crossing, which the Lewises later uh, were in charge of. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid he didn't make it. Oh. At the age of 29, William the Third, Great yeah. Hope of Cathartha, was pulled down in the storm and was drowned at the age of 29. It's mean, de- to realise how perilous it was crossing the Seven at that point. <laughs> I mean, so terrible. We just drive across it now without a second thought. And you think, oh, how, de- oh, how dangerous it actually was before the railway tunnel came, you know? Absolutely. His, so he's lost his, his son and heir. Um, and he has, a, he has Caversham, I've mentioned. This is Caversham Park. Hmm. Then in Oxfordshire, oh. now in Bedfordshire. Yeah. And he rented it for a while and he'd go there every with his wife and he'd enjoy the air and he'd get away from the hard work because his Iron Masters do work hard. Hmm. These aren't like the aristocrats that we've talked about. Some of the aristocrats we've talked about, these are hands on. Yeah. Um, and he goes there and he decides to buy it in 1847 and almost immediately it burns down. And it turns out he'd insured all the farms around it, but not the mansion itself. <laughs> not a wise move. So William II he has so much money, he just rebuilds it. That's incredible, isn't it? And in later years, he tried to rebuild it brick for brick and extend it. In later years, this became the home of BBC Monitoring until extremely recently. Oh, right. Haversham Park. It's still there, but the BBC have now moved out. Mm. So the question is, and there he is in later years... I mean, his dad did eventually die in 1834, and William II continued until 1867, which is really when the iron business in Wales is on a downturn. Oh, right. Steel has come in. Yeah. And the crochets have not adapted. Oh, that's interesting. And so they're losing money. Mm. So who should take over? Is his surviving eldest son, Francis, my particular favourite. But there's yeah. a reason you don't put Francis in charge of anything. What? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to do with his neck beard. Oh, dear. oh dear. the owner of the most ridiculous facial hair I think we've seen in about 18 or 20 podcasts. Really? Very cruel. <laughs> what are you thinking about that, man? It's like, I'm going to have a beard, but I don't want a beard. Well, just don't have a beer then. It's the fashion really, of the time. It's a ludicrous thing, and it's a and and it's a ginger beard. I speak as a man who had a ginger beard myself. There is nothing. You stop picking on Francis Crochet's there, beard. There's nothing flattering about a ginger beard, I'm afraid. <laughs> when you're quite really, having a ba- stop having a bash at my Francis, we <laughs> will. He was actually given a role away from Kafava. He was put in charge of the Heerwine Ironworks. Again, pretty big. This is a mm. big job. But when he moved there, he refused to live in the big house and built a cottage for himself instead. Uh, he was a good man. I mean, on built the a Kafava, cottage for himself? Just a little cottage. Well, I mean, the... I mean, a proper ditty little cottage, not like what the royal family called a cottage. And it's no, actually... no, no, it, it was quite a reasonable, I mean, by crochet style, it was a very small cottage. And... He had a lump of coal with his name sort of etched on it. Uh, and during the cholera epidemic of 1849, he refused to leave. He tried to help his workers in any... This is the time, by the way, when when you were paid, your wages were dumped in a vat of water. And you had to pick them out because of the cholera. Oh, that's it. I never knew. How interesting. I never knew that. And not only did he oh. not leave, he helped everyone he possibly could during that epidemic. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's to the man's credit, give him his due. He's also the only crochet to speak Welsh fluently. But he, he does himself down with self-deprecation. When asked about this, he said, well, I learnt Welsh so I could swear at my staff in their own language. <laughs> it's really not the case. No, no, no. And he also had a William Jones Chapman, an artist, paint his workers leading to the very rare 16 portraits of workers at Heerline and Treforest Tin Plate Works, which was the largest yeah. tin plate works in the world. He was in charge of that as well, when he could be bothered. He yeah, was yeah. slightly indolent and spent a lot yeah. of money, in fairness to Francis. Yeah. And here's some of the little, you know. It's interesting. From the oh, highest yeah. to the lowest, he had them painted. Yeah. 
Oh, that's cool. Look at that. And these have survived. I mean, yeah. he uh, when he went to Treforest Tin Plate, well, oh, also at Heerwein, um, he built um, Crochet Tower. Oh, look at that, yeah. It looks a bit battered now, yeah. uh, as you can see here. But the idea was he built this tower and he put cannon in it. And people say, well, it's because he wanted to defend himself against any uprising. Yeah, I've heard that one. But I'm not so sure that anyone particularly yeah. want to rise up against Francis. Yeah. Or Mr. Yeah. Frank, as he was known. Yeah. <laughs> and his works. You wonder if it's more or less a sort of a folly, really, rather than anything. It's a folly. Else. Yeah. Although he did spend, uh, he did spend uh, certain amounts of summer here. Mm. Um, and also his, his mate. He allowed him possibly to go there to hide out from the authorities. Francis was a slightly naughty crochet. <laughs> Unfortunately, Crochet's tower today doesn't look quite so good. Oh, oh that's a shame. <laughs> Ever so slightly. Yeah. <laughs> when he was at Treforest, he lived in this house, which is always called Forest House, but for some unknown reason is now referred to as T. Crochet, which historically it wasn't, and is now part of the um, campus of the University of South Wales in Treforest. Oh, how interesting. Mr. Francis's um, um, house. He also owned Barry Island before the Jenners. Oh, Come right. Oh, yeah. Go to our Wenvo Castle podcast. Yeah. And he put a land in there for his yacht. At Barry Island? At Barry Island, yeah. He oh, liked right. to hunt, uh, rather than working, he quite often liked to hunt rabbits. Uh, he just um, liked to go <laughs> yachting. <laughs> Well, when he's that generation of the people, they've made the money long enough now that he doesn't have to sit and it keeps rolling in, sort of, even though it's going downhill slightly. He's got, he's got more money than he knows what to do with. He's just going to spend it. And he, there seems to be a lot of families that boomed at this period. Is they, you know, The early part of it, they, they accumulate the wealth and then they, they, they maintain their wealth and then they spend most of the time just frittering it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Frank was the of the fritterer variety. Yeah. But he was still in charge of here wine iron works and Treforest tin plate works. These are massive things. Um, great story about him and his individuality and being a pain, quite frankly. Um, he was hiring a new gardener once, and as a test, he basically left all these shrubs and he said to the the people, the gardeners who were coming as an interview for the job, I want you to plant these upside down. And we got the roots here, plant them upside down. So one guy can't professional pride he plants mm. them the right way up or they'll die and um francis comes back and he says well now i'm sorry you're not for me but they will die if we plant them upside down he said don't care you're gone so another guy comes in and he does plant them upside down and francis then says well plant them the right way up but you listen to me you'll do for me <laughs> it's a little test will you do what yeah. mr frank yeah, tells you to do unquestioningly. Yeah, oh dear me. Pretty much. But a hugely um, dramatic, in 1843, um, thing happened at Treforest House, or T. Crochet as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, his wife, Laura, there is Laura. Oh. Um, his wife, Laura, was pregnant and it wasn't going well. In fact, oh. it looked as if she might well die and the baby might well die. So what Francis did was he called for the surgeon for the Treforest Tin Plate Works, which is a close personal friend of his called the Reverend William Price. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> oh, well, well, well. <laughs> we get him there with his goat looking up. Yep. And the Reverend William Price performed on the table, the kitchen table of, tr of this house, a caesarean section, and it might have been one of the earliest caesarean sections where both the mother and child survived. Oh, gosh. How oh, interesting. So well done, yeah. Reverend William Price. And Price, of course, was in all kinds of bother. And it, it is whispered and suggested that Francis allowed him to hide out at Crochet Tower to avoid oh, the authority. Oh, right. Oh, so he is the one hiding out at the, the, the tower. Oh, I see. He was the one hiding out. And they both loved a Druidism. Oh, really? Francis loved Druidism. and they, oh, I and don't they yeah, I've heard of that connection. with Obviously, that's a very famous connection with William Price. So I never knew uh, the, cro the crochets of, uh, had a flutter with it. Well, Francis had more than a flutter. Yeah. Because he built this uh, close to his home at, uh, at Treforest. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> well, well, well. 
That was only destroyed when they um, built the uh, School of Mines and uh, extended the campus and they destroyed, unfortunately, his. But somebody did write that you would always see Francis Crochet. This is interesting, Goff, and this could go into all. We might have to deal with this in a live stream for time purposes. Mm. Francis Crochet would often be leading druids in the daytime, but also leading a procession to a graveyard at night. Direct quote. Not particularly druidic, is it? No. What's going on there? That's interesting. That shows other occult tendencies, but What's you're... Mr. Frank up to? Hmm. That's a, sh that's a shame destroying that. Why then? Earth are going to legitimately destroy that? It is a shame. Uh, he did when they eventually closed. Uh, I mean, Hirwine, he left Hirwine in 1859. He closed Forest in 1867. So then he moved to Kent and had a stately home called Bradbourne Hall, which you can see here. And mm. when he, and again, they talked about Druidism, um, that he was up to the Druidic things. And he started building these monoliths, Egyptian style, <laughs> Egyptian style monoliths in Kent. And you know what? Some of them are still there. They built a housing estate over what was part of the grounds of Bradbourne yeah. Hall, but someone has still got a Frank Crochet monolith in their back garden <laughs> in oh, Kent. Lord. It's a wonderful <laughs> legacy. Yeah, my <laughs> lord. <laughs> but he also put, when he got gout in later years, see this huge bell here? Yeah, I say, what's the bell for? And he had... Um, he liked ringing the bell at half five to wake everyone up in the nearby village. I'm sure he was popular. Oh, yeah, yeah. But when he got gout, he actually had a rope leading into his bedroom. And whenever he got too, it got too painful, he would ring the bell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A hand bell was not sufficient. No. <laughs> you want the whole of Kent to know that you've got yeah. gout and you need help. Yeah. <laughs> And there's Frank in later life. He dis he reverted to wearing nautical dress quite often. Oh, good lord! Isn't he marvelous? This character, yeah. There's a what slight you... part of him that isn't marvelous that he shares with the Reverend William Price, his close personal friend, yeah. and that's an almost Boris Johnsonian um, capacity of fathering children. Oh right! Oh yeah. The estimate <laughs> for Crochet alone was twenty-eight to thirty illegitimate children. Oh, that was right. <laughs> really? Good heavens. And poor Laura <laughs> must have been extremely <laughs> forgiving because what he would do to the children is he'd offer them a job. Oh, yeah. If it was a daughter, they'd work in his house. Yeah. If it was a, um, um, a son, they'd go in his nearby works and he'd pay them yeah. money. So he oh. employed his children because there were just so many of them. Oh, good, good Lord, it's astonishing, isn't it? He's quite the man. So can you understand I... why he, his dad decided not to give him Kafafa? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, he never got his hands on the big house. No, oh, God. So his younger brother did. Ah. Oh. Robert oh. Thompson Crochet, who took over in 18... Well, he was... By the age of 22, he was in charge. Hmm. But 1867, he took over the whole thing. Now, Robert Thompson Crochet is, in my opinion, the great what-if... Because as yeah. a young man, he really loved the iron business and he loved the iron workers. So much so he worked amongst them to know every bit of the iron work industry. He dressed like them. He ate like them. He yeah. was amongst them. Yeah. It was very unusual for the crochets. Yeah. But unfortunately, it didn't all, it didn't really um, end up that way. Hmm. Um, the slight, I mean, the problem was that he would... Um, as he got older, and as he took uh, as he took on more and more of the business, and have we got his wife? Oh yeah, his wife. He married very well. This is Rosemary Yates, who he married. Now, like William Price, she was a big promoter of cremation. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was um, Price's um, act of cremation, cremating his son, that actually sort of made it that legitimized it. It was considered a, it was permitted because it was considered a legitimate act of faith. Um, and it led to the the yeah the popularization of it. So that's interesting that she was a, another advocate for it. And not only an advocate for that, this lady Rosemary Crochet has to be up there with the two ladies Rhonda, although everyone forgets the first one. Oh, the yeah. two ladies Rhonda, and even dear old Gertrude Jenner of Wenbo oh, for really? all her eccentricities, because yeah. she was in very much for female suffrage, very much for education, 
She made sure that there were free libraries open on a Sunday so people could use. She was oh. in favour of decimal coinage and simplified spelling. Oh, blimey. And you had people that would, uh, would that knew her very well, some of which stayed at Kafafa. Um, incredible people, including Robert Browning, the poet, Henry Irving, the actor, and stay, uh, Charles Darwin. And staying at Kafafa oh. was Ralph Waldo Emerson. So she was oh, very cultured. Oh, yeah. Her husband wasn't quite, and it was not a happy marriage, I'm afraid. Yeah. Oh. Um, the, the man who was our great hope as a young man immersing himself in the ironworkers, um, did change. Um, he loved music initially, and this is the Kafafa Band, mm. oh, which yeah. he founded as early as 1838. And the Kafafa Band was his personal band. Oh, right. He uh, enrolled all over Britain. Yeah. This was, I mean, it wasn't a municipal band. A brass band owned by one person is extremely yeah. rare in Britain. Oh, gosh. This was Crochet's band. Yeah. And there was an awful lot of, um, uh, even though the ironworks is sort of dipping at this point, mm. they haven't adapted to steel, it's still pretty impressive. You can see it from the castle in the time of Robert Thompson Crochet looking out to the ironworks. Yeah. And you've got these hot houses. Yeah. And really, do you know the first, or the, uh, it was said that the first symbol of the um, Kafatha Museum was going to be a pineapple. Because the crochets grew um, 3,000 pineapples, I think it was. 3,000 pineapple plants they had here. And every <laughs> Christmas, 100 pineapples uh, were used by the crochets for their Christmas festivities. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, what were they doing with them all? Who knows? I mean, it is a symbol of uh, welcome and uh, hospitality yeah. in the Victorian times. In fact, everybody went home with one. Everyone, everyone, take a yeah. pineapple home with you. Yeah, they must be. Well, I mean, they must but be, this is impressive. Like a pineapple in Cavalier Castle, that's all I can say. <laughs> well, that, that, what we did, we both worked at the, um, um, well, I won't mention it, um, the Citrus Festival at Tradiga House, where <laughs> pineapples were. Um, it was hard. It's hard to grow pineapples. Uh, well, yeah, in yeah, South Wales in the nineteenth century. Um, but Mr. Betjeman, very poetical name. Mr. Betjeman was the head gardener at this time. So he did the pineapples brilliantly, but his quest, which he never fulfilled, was for the perfect grape. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Didn't quite make the perfect grape, but well done, Mr. Betjeman. Yeah. So you've got an awful lot. By the way, the sellers. The sellers, if they sold the contents of the sellers when they sold the house, the sellers were more valuable than the house. Gosh. They had 15,000 bottles. Oh, that's astonishing, isn't it? Uh, it Grief. really, really is. I mean, I mean, it really is. So there's an awful lot of luxury. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 it's plutocratic living, isn't it? I mean... And yet, in 1860, uh, Robert Thompson Crochet was hit with a, with a stroke, an mm. enormous stroke, which rendered him stone deaf. Oh. So his passion for music, of course, was gone. Oh, yeah. And his temperament, I'm not saying that he wasn't, didn't have an unpleasant side before this, mm. but it really came out after the stroke of 1860. Oh, that's interesting. And unfortunately, the person that suffered most from this was his own favourite daughter, Rose Harriet. Mm. I mean, first of all, what do you have to fill the gap when you lose music? And that's mm. your passion. There he is in later life. Mm. Well, photography. He had the money. If we oh. look at this floor plan, I know it's not easy to read. And I do apologise for that. But over oh, here... Yeah, that's it. Photographic studio. Yeah. Photographic studio. Yeah. So he started his own photographic studio, but he basically would have a whistle. When he blew it, his daughter Harriet, or Trotty, as she was known, mm. Trotty had to come and pose for the photographs, or even do the chemical reactions to develop the photographs. It's really rough. I mean, he blows a whistle. If you're Trotty, you come. And her diary does suggest something. This is, this is her diary. I was taken to be photographed in the afternoon, which put me in a bad temper. I hate it more than I can tell. Uh -huh. I was photographed as a fisherwoman with the salmon. And a precious fright I looked. Papa mm. came in with the ugliest, nastiest old straw bonnet. Um, 
ugliest narcissist old straw bonnet that ever existed. Mm. And she writes, I was photographed with my hair down in wild disorder Gorgon fashion. Mm. Papa says I am a lout not to have kept steady yesterday being photographed. She also has to do the, the, the washing of the prints, and she writes, washed a lot of prints, got three fresh chillblains. Really, what with chillblains and chaps from the coldness of the water washing the prints and the stains from the chemicals all over my hands, they are not fit to be seen. It is too bad. I don't believe another lady in the kingdom has such hands. There she is. Oh. Yeah, that's the... the, the, the... Gosh, why was he so obsessed with this? I honestly don't know. Um, the, and the, the sad fact is, I mean, as the ironworks declines because yeah. they still haven't moved to steel, yeah, so it's pretty bad. But this man, towards the end of his life, was something of a tyrant, especially to Trotty. Mm. And mm. This this daughter who did so much for him and put up with so much. I think she grabbed the crochet family motto of perseverance because it got mm. it through it, got her through it. Mm. He fell in love. And she fell in love with a local barrister. Uh, so she falls in love with this local barrister and she goes off to marry him. And because she went off to marry him and left the old man, he basically refused to attend the wedding and wrote his, her children out of his will. Oh. Strange, isn't it? By this point in 1874, there was a uh, coal strike. He'd opened a few coal mines to try and make a bit more money. So they were selling coal as well as iron. Still hadn't shifted to steel. And he, after they clo he closed the furnaces, he closed the ironworks in 1874, he didn't reopen them. That's a thousand men destitute. Mm. He was adamant. He was anti-union. Yeah. And he was right. And he was convinced yeah. that what he was doing was right. Yeah. And his family produced all of this employment for the area and created you know, this for Mirtha. So in 1877, when he really ended the final lap of his life, by this time he was stone deaf and half blind and there was a paralysis. Oh, gosh. The men of the area, when he came home from hospital in 1877, gathered in front of the castle to wish him well. But really, it's a yearning. Yeah. Please open the works again. Mm. But he didn't. He'd, he'd done the maths. Yeah. It wouldn't pay. The crochets are nothing if not businessmen. Yeah. yeah. And even, what, what, three generations removed from Richard the Yorkshire lad? Yeah. He dies in 1879. And that's at Vayner Church. That's what his gravestone yeah. says. God forgive me. God forgive me. That has been one of the things that always puzzled me from the 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 day I first encountered that inscription, it, it's well, you've a, seen a, that, yeah. Psychologically, what a what a thing, you know. Mm. What because what it basically you know says is he knew he knew how bloody awful he was. <laughs> you know, it wasn't someone who was acting necessarily out of principle. He knew the consequences. He knew the awfulness of his behaviour, and he did it anyway. And and that's it. And that's the the frightening thing about it. And, and I guess I mean, oh, may God forgive me. You know, really, really. Well, what we know is a fact. Had something to request God to forgive him for. Yeah. What we know is an absolute fact is God forgive me was personally wanted by Robert Thompson Crochet. Yeah. But not something that someone else has added. Yeah. This is what he wanted. Yeah. But we do not know because towards the end of his life, he did not show any regret. He was convinced he was doing the right thing. Mm. He used to say that the pre union men of Kavartha. They were the ones, they were the real workers. He did not believe in unionism to his dying day. And again, is it to do with his daughter? We do not know is the truth. Anything that me and you might say, Goff, we don't know the truth of why it says, God forgive me. Someone no, has, put, has purported it could be a generic thing you put on a gravestone. I'm not convinced by that argument. No, I'm not either. It, it's, it, 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 no, it, it's uh, most... Yeah, I haven't come across tombstones that generally do that very often, do they? God, God, the request forgiveness means that you think you have something you need to be forgiven for. It's not generic, is it? No, no. I mostly don't... it's you know, you know, taken into the arms of Jesus and all these things, sleeping with Christ and all that stuff. It doesn't, at this period, particularly in the 1870s, that is um, very, very intriguing. 
statement. Well, so there's something about the actual the the the, the grave site itself is is in very very sort of armored in a way. It's a, it's a, it's a concrete base and it's sealed with this solid slab and it's sort of so nobody. Oh. Because didn't he have fears that they would actually get there and dig him up? Afterwards? Well, there's lots of nonsense about this. Oh, there is, isn't there? A lot of nonsense. I mean, some of the stories are that he was buried upside down to get him to hell quicker. <laughs> there are stories that his wealth was buried with him, so he didn't yeah. have to give it you know, to Trotty and all of that. It's all a nonsense, that sort of thing. It's it's a typical grave with the railings around. Even Francis, my favourite yeah. crochet, has railings around his grave in Kent. But actually, the railings are amazing because they are shaped like anchors. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, but no, um, there is nothing like that. Uh, some actually said yeah. that the uh, the stone is so thick, and it is very thick, yeah. to stop him getting out again out of his grave. Yeah, oh, yeah. All this is nonsense. No. To go by the historical fact, he wanted God forgive me. Yeah. The debate can maybe continued in the comments section. Yeah. But anyone who tells you that they know for certain that they know what God forgive me means, there's no hard evidence. Yeah. Anyway. Interesting, isn't it? But but what it is, so what those stories about the gravesite tell you is the way he was perceived in the area, doesn't it? You know, oh, no, it's how he perceives Because you want himself. two things. He's... You either want him to go, no, I mean, the idea that he's buried face down so he can get the oh, hell. Yeah, 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 the story. And the fact that the stone's so heavy to stop him getting out again, that shows you how he was how he was really thought of, wasn't it? They did, yeah, they didn't want him to go to heaven and they didn't want him to come back. I don't want to make excuses. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he was nowhere near as ruthless as Richard, the original Yorkshire boy. Hmm. Um, but how much do we put down to this stroke? Or is this finding excuses for, you know, uh, behavior well, I mean, which can, really if did? You can, if you can, if you can, you know, detect a clear change in, in personality and behavior um, post stroke to comparing to pre stroke, then you, you could make a case for saying that it might, there may be some connections with it. Um, Difficult, it, isn't it? It is difficult, but again, we don't we, we we don't have sort of the medical knowledge of understanding and to do it. You know, it, you're getting into sort of Henry the Eighth territory. You know, the oh, after the leg injury, yeah. after the leg injury, and and the and the the twenty eight hour, the forty eight hours of unconsciousness sort of thing. You know, you think that his behaviour changes. How much it's dependent on what happens, you don't know. So you can say the same with um, crochet, really. Yeah. Well, by the way, Trotty, the daughter, lived until the 1940s, if you can believe. Oh, oh good. He lived a very old age, so oh, well done, Trotty. Her. No good more developing <laughs> of photographs. Yeah, yeah, lived in by 60 years, virtually. Good for her. Yeah, <laughs> good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, when he dies in 1879, I mean, by now, the ironworks are finished. Mm. It's all steel. Mm. And so his son takes over, a very shy, retiring chap called William Thompson Crochet, who you can see here. He takes oh, over. Yeah. I mean, he's not really the ruthless tyrant that some of the Crochets were. Yeah. He's not really the great characters of, uh, that some of the Crochets were. Um, he marries a lady called um, uh, Florentia Wood of Colonel Wood's family. Yeah. Wood has been mentioned many times on our various podcasts, the Wood family, Pierce Field and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Flo was all right. Flo was fine. <laughs> you approve of Flo. That's Flo, right. good old Flo. If you could yeah. play cards, she'd invite you to Kafartha. All right. <laughs> and this seems to be a happy marriage, unlike the previous one. So yeah. we're all right. Um, the problem is, of course, that um, living at Kafartha, when the money is starting to run out and the ironworks isn't making a profit, and even selling coal isn't doing great at this point. Yeah. Um, so they leave, and they leave sort of two rooms open just in case they ever want to go back. So the rest of the castle is um, pretty much dust covers and that sort of thing, until they get rid of all the furniture and all the curtains and all the carpets. Oh, blimey. So when they get rid of everything, they get rid of everything. Yeah. The Father Castle of the 20th century, because it, it's not making money. Um, it is. They do turn it into a steelworks. Uh, when they take over, this is the only painting of Kafartha as a steelworks. Steel and this is uh, done by a man called Thomas Prithurch. Now, Goff, Prithurch, if you remember when we did, oh, it seems like 50 years ago, we did Thomas Prothero podcast. Yeah. His great grandfather was known as Prithurch, not Prothero. 
that that really is is, um what an interesting uh connection so thomas prithirch possibly the same family as our well, it's an unusual Tom. enough name, isn't it? I mean, it's not it's exactly a common name. Not Pretty really. Much. Oh, interesting. Anyway, it's a, it's a great painting, uh, mm-hmm. but it shows oh, yeah. the only image of, of uh, Kafartha as a steelworks, which it should have been if they wanted to survive 50 years before this. Yeah, yeah. It's easy for me to say, isn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, yeah. Well, it's I mean, interesting. The cr- but they, they, they just, why they just didn't keep up, keep pace with the changing times is... They were people obviously very acute businessmen at the early stages when they set up, but they seem to have not moved with the times for some reason. Absolutely right. But they didn't want to make the investment. Perhaps they just wanted to keep a grip on the money. Well, then maybe they didn't have the fire within them. Yeah. But maybe Moloch had left. Yeah. It wasn't within them, you know. Those that make the money and consolidate it often have the, the fire, don't they? Hmm. Those that inherit it. Yeah. But I have noticed a lot of the aristocrats we talked about did have noblesse oblige, you know. Yes. It's a terrible yeah. thing for a meritocrat like me to say, but there isn't that massive philanthropy with the crochets. No. That you might have got with some of the others. Is that fair? Yeah. No, no, I think it's it is fair comment. I mean, it's a it's a it's a comment that, that is made necessarily all over almost today, isn't it? Is that... <laughs> People that make the money keep a grip on the money. That's how they keep. That's how they become rich. Those you know? that inherit it feel People guilty. People who inherit it are a bit freer with it. They found that yeah, poorer poorer individuals who inherit the lottery give more to charity than more affluent people who win the lottery. Well, that's an interesting point. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, very good. Um, anyway, in the end, this can't go on forever. So, Kafartha Castle was sold in 1908. And in fact, the ironworks was taken over, or the steelworks was taken over, and unfortunately, it was taken over by a company, the Guests. They hated the Guests. No. It was taken over by Guest, Keen, and Nettlefolds, which is a shame in many ways. So the Guests basically won the longevity battle there. Yeah. Um, but the Corsets, it was uh, all sold off. So 1908, the council decide they're going to buy it, which is essentially what it is. And then they have this thing where... Um, they open it for the public and then are horrified when the public turn up. <laughs> really? <laughs> Anyone who's worked in conservation yeah. will know this. Yeah. Um, life is wonderful and you want to show off this historic building, yeah. but my goodness, it's hard when the public turn up. Yeah, yeah, you've got to, yeah, you've got to keep the <laughs> keep the balance, isn't it? Yeah, get too many in it damages the building you're trying to conserve for them. Yes, it's, yes, I'm it's... not sure what they were expecting, quite frankly, because no. on the grand opening in 1908, yeah. uh, I'm sure people came from out of town. I mean, it was a free for all, you know. I mean, you know what it's like even at Tradiga House when it's a free for all day. Oh, yeah. Um, but at, but when this has become available, people have different mindsets about visiting it, and yeah. the press get very vapory about it. The, uh, the vapors are well, well, innocent. Oh, they were all over the place, and then it gets gradually worse. And you think, oh, actually, they've got a point. This isn't. We can't continue like this, no. because they start out with things such as, oh, and they were they were they were walking all over it, and they picked the rhododendrons, and then oh. it carries on, and then and then it gets to they stole lead from the roof. <laughs> <laughs> My particular highlight was when they started to open the sluice gates. Oh my God. <laughs> and then you think, all right, yeah, you can't let them do that. That's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> you can't yeah. let them open the sluice picking gates. The wrong, this... Picking the road at end was probably not, not good, but you get them at opening the sluice gates and I'm nicking the lead. Stripping the lead from the roof. Going a bit far. Yeah. <laughs> More than a, just a memento of your visit, is it? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, the crochets sold it to the corporation for eighteen thousand oh, pounds, which God. is less than the cell, the contents of the sellers the seller, yeah. are worth. Yeah. Um, so, what are they going to do with it? Well, they opened a museum initially on the ground floor, then mm. in nineteen thirteen, it became a secondary school. So, the girls upstairs, oh, the boys, and the museum downstairs. Oh, interesting! In nineteen forty-five, it became a grammar school. And they built other buildings, you see. So that's yeah. a, you notice we didn't do the National Library of Scotland map like we normally do. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. We really didn't change that much other than the disappearance of the ironworks. Yeah. 
except these school buildings around it. This yeah. is the only podcast we've done where when we've done that, actually the building grew. Grew. Oh, right. Oh, interesting. The footprint yeah. grew. Got bigger, yeah. It became a comprehensive school in 1970, and it stopped being a school in 2014. Oh, blimey. The oh, Arthur Castle School. And that's yeah. how it looks today. Yeah. Oh, you've been there, haven't you? you I'm, I remember I you. I visited to, it's a museum, but did you work? Did you, did you do a job there, or? Uh, no, I actually just I actually spent as a visitor because I've oh, always right. heard of Father Castle. I wanted to go and see it, so yeah, so I went in around the museum part and down. And the entrance hall is very, very, very impressive entrance. Hall. Oh yeah, uh, and then the museum structure. There's a lot of a lot of um, yeah, displays. There. There's a very interesting display in the cellars. Um, takes Ooh, you through. I like, got a story about this. Writing various things. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a nice, it's a, a lovely building. Goff, you'll like this. There was a story I picked up accidentally, which should maybe be saved for a Halloween edition, mm. uh, which we've never done. We've promised one for three years, but we've never yeah. actually done one. But we will this year. And somebody said that they were amazed when they went into the cellars at the animatronic figures they had down there, and they stopped to watch the animatronic figures of crochets and various servants yeah. for ten minutes. Yeah, they went up and told them in the museum yeah. and the shop area, uh, and of course there are no animatronics. No, I don't want to think that there are. Oh my goodness me! Do know what they were looking at? Goodness knows. Anyway, we'll get back to that in October. Um, the ironworks, the greatest ironworks on the face of the planet. Um, I find that Merthyr people are very much like New Portonians in that they are very quick to yeah. talk down their town. Yeah, yeah. But this really was the centre of the industrialised world. Did you know that Donetsk in Ukraine was until 1861 called Hughesovska? Hugh oh, really? Hughesovska? Oh, Mr yeah. Hughes yeah. from Merthyr yeah. actually went over there and founded the city, which is now about a million people. Oh, gosh. <laughs> because of the funny. ironworks. It's a great yeah. steel and ironworks yeah. place. Well, well, you know, <laughs> good luck. Mirtha have a lot to brag about. Yes, yeah. And it's n they really were the centre of the industrialised world as far as yeah. advancement were concerned. And the crochets are to be thanked for that, at least. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, and here it is as a museum to this day. Yeah. All very good. The Victorian pictures of this as a museum are just completely over. Every, th every bit of space has a glass case of a stuffed something. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Health and safety, you couldn't allow it these days. Yeah. This is far um, better. It is a very, uh, it is a lovely space. It's a lovely space. And they've still got the remains of the furnaces. Oh, right. These mighty furnaces. Yeah. And there is some good news because they have got an, if it goes ahead, hmm. like 50 million pounds investment is going to happen. This oh, whole Cathartha really? Castle place is going to be, if it goes ahead. Yeah. Disclaimer is very important when it comes yeah. to tourism. Uh, they've got amazing plans for Cavalfa Castle and the uh, what's left of the ironworks. And, uh, very interesting. I mean, we, yeah, we 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 are we have been ne neglectful of our industrial history and heritage. I think because when you live in it, and you work in it, and you know how bloody hard it is and how awful it was, you tend to you, you, you don't mourn its passing, you know. Mm. But it was in incredibly. Um, important and and, and uh, a, a feature of what of this area i mean it even changed physically changed the landscape oh yeah of of, of where of where the people in this part of wales live nowadays so yeah it might perhaps it is time to have a proper a, a refreshing a, a refresh of it and another look at it and you know and 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 address these things you know i was fascinated i mean i went to blanavan iron works recently you know which is a candy property astonishing absolutely astonishing piece of history um, so again, it'd be lovely to see if something like that could happen around around Merthyr, really, for that area. Bring bring something of those, bring it back. Also, celebrate all those poor buggers that died and sweated in that industry to keep Kafartha alive. You know, mm. it's a it's a Kafartha Castle on the hill. You know, it's a it's astonishing. It's a, maybe it's, the old dog has one more bark. Yeah, yeah, it'd be nice too, wouldn't it, to see something. Yeah, well, we'll see. So anyway, I don't know whether we succeeded in what we set out to do with that podcast, Goff, but there's a lot of history to get through. But mm. the problem is, it, it, it's our most, is it our most modern podcast? Close, isn't it? 1820s? 
Maybe Malpas. Oh, yeah, because it is, yeah. Yeah, really, but it's yeah. certainly, I mean, the crochets were only there from 1825 up until, well, what, about 60 years? Yeah, but the, but the impact... Impact was on, on, on the on the on the 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 economy, the global economy, the local economy, the the actual infrastructure of the place, the mm. building. It's phenomenal, phenomenal for a, for a short period of time. Their impact is absolutely incredible. They were the, at that you know forefront of of the industrial revolution, which to some extent, you know, with regards to. You know, not to tread on sensitive issues, but you know the the ramifications of, of on environmental impact we are still living with from that surge of uh, that came about. You know, and and the the technologies and things we have in life. You know, we, we, it, the world prior to that it was uh, had been more or less consistently agrarian up until oh absolutely you know, the nineteenth, the latter part of the eighteenth century, really when it really when it starts. Um, that we we the it's 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 incomparable the world we live in now, and the, but, and again we live in with the some of the more un, uncomfortable hangovers of it as well. So it, and also I mean, much has changed. Everything there is, is a lot has changed, but Murtha has a lot at this period uh, has a yeah. huge legacy. You know, the first locomotive steam powered locomotive on rails um, yeah. was Murtha. In yeah. fact, Richard Crawshay had a bet with Sam Humphrey. Oh yeah. Of which one would get it done first? And Samuel Humphrey won a thousand guineas with that yeah. bet. Yeah. I mean, uh, Murtha changed the world in that respect. Yeah. Oh yeah. And they phenomenal. shouldn't be afraid of saying that. No. 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 Anyway, we've done our thing. I hope we've it fills it. a hole because we needed yeah. the Iron Masters in, and we may yeah. do Lord Glenusk if you allow us to go to Breckenshire. Yeah. Um, at some point. Now we've got a schedule. I nobody cared, Goff. I put it out in a in a community post, and nobody cared. Nobody um, cared. Nobody cared. I put our schedule out for the next few. Um, no interaction whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> we're here because it's fun. <laughs> um, I pointed out that we were. I hope you agree to this, by the way, because I did it independently without you. I know he hadn't told me this. I said, "Sorry, oh, me, folks." <laughs> I put our schedule as we're doing Kafartha Castle next. Did that. Yeah. And um, then we get Trigger House Part Two. Okay? Yeah. And we need a live stream because Bunter's been up to stuff. Bunter Beaufort hey. in the Times this morning. Oh, was he? We Real. need a live stream to catch up with the many comments we've had. Yeah. Which we need to catch up on and reply to. And the latest news in Heritage, developments at Rupera Castle and all sorts. So that's yeah. the live stream. That's okay. That'll be, that'll be lovely. Yeah. There we are. That's fine. That'll do for me. I'm a happy little pasty. That's all that matters. Um, Thank you very much for watching. If you've watched it this far, thank you. If you've watched it this far, you're probably already subscribed. But if you're yeah. not, please click subscribe. We are approaching 500, which is the only goal I had when I started this. So if you could urge friends to subscribe, yeah. even if they don't watch, getting 500 might be a Pyrrhic victory, but it'll be our victory. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, we shall see you again very soon. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.